here um, at the nomination of uh, Senator Speaker and Tom Dale, who was working with him and myself um, to put a vision for the future. So in his real life, he is a distinguished professor of sustainability at Cal and Dawson University, where he directs the Center for Complex Systems and Transition, and he's also the academic director of the Sustainability Institute. So he's heavily involved in teaching and research and many health organizations. Mark is somebody who is considered an, an integrated scientist in, in many respects, but because he's just fascinated with how we use technology, how we use policy, how we use humanism, um, how we use urban environmental systems thinking to develop sustainable cities um, and urban areas, and how we would actually build them in a way that would adapt to uh, changing environmental conditions. And so here, uh, he will be here for uh, the better part of a year. Um, and so if any of you are interested in engaging him, uh, he walks the hill and he'll be prospects and he will be happy to talk to some of you um, over the course of the year. So with that, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. I really uh, appreciate uh, this opportunity to break away from my own context, uh, which is a bit hectic. As you probably know, we've just been through a peaceful political transition um, from a situation ruled over by an unfortunate president, which I'm sure you, some of you might understand, and uh, somebody who's uh, pretty progressive. Um, but I just don't know how you withstand this weather, this cold. I, I just would not survive here for more than the time that I, <laughs> I am here. Um, I come from uh, Stellenbosch University, which is in the, uh, the southernmost uh, tip of the African continent, just inland of Cape Town. Uh, I've spent uh, the last 15 years uh, or so um, part-time involved in building South Africa's first non-racial or multiracial, depending on what terms you like to use, eco-village, a group of people who want to live sustainably in a socially uh, mixed way. And I mention this because it contrasts very drastically with other parts of the work that I do. I'm just about to publish this book called The Shadow State, The Politics of State Capture, which is really about how the country was being stolen by a power elite that has just been somewhat displaced. But I'm also interested in, the, in, in global challenges, and this report uh, coming out uh, under the auspices of the International Resource Panel uh, in April uh, is the outcome of a couple of years of research with an amazing research team from around the world that really tries to grapple with this, this, this question of what are the resource requirements of future urbanization based on the assumption that the United Nations statistics uh, tends to reproduce that the urban population is going to double between 2010 and 2050, or is estimated to double. And I've been very, very involved uh, in a group that has tried to estimate uh, the implications of this, and this is just a summary diagram that, that estimates that the, from using DMC as the calculator, we're going to more than double the resource requirements of cities around the world if nothing changes. In other words, a business as usual scenario would, would estimate a, a more than doubling of the resource uh, requirements. And it's even worse when it comes to land, as Karen and others here would know, uh, business as usual will probably mean more than a doubling of the urban land requirements from uh, one million square kilometers to two and a half. Um, the, the International Resource Panel target of uh, six to eight tons per capita per, per year as a rough estimate of what a sustainable, what sustainable living would look like, which is drastically lower than the 30, 30 40 tons here, uh, would, 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 would give you a figure of roughly half of, those, of that re resource requirements. And we just use that baseline to then estimate the resource implications of a whole ra range of urban innovations, like bus rapid transit systems, um, uh, green, green, green buildings, waste systems, and so on, the usual set of more sustainable urban practices. But what we wanted to do is say, are these going to make a significant difference? And the overall conclusion is yes. But that was really just the, the instigator of my interest in a, 
in a, in, a, in a subsequent question, which is how do things change? So we're very, very um, good in the scientific community at generating the enormous amounts of quantitative data required to reinforce the proposition that things do need to drastically change. But the question is, how does that change come about? And I started to reflect on my own experience in the building of an eco-village in, in, in the most unequal and in one of the most uh, divided and obviously racist societies in the world, in South Africa, where over the last 15 years, I have in practice been actually doing a lot of thinking and practicing around what does change mean. And I started to gravitate towards a literature about urban experimentation. And that's really what I want to talk about uh, today and share with you. And it's, 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 it's this, this idea of trying to build um, a theory of a change commensurate with our times is really what I'm doing here in, in, in Yale, uh, which is writing a book called Just Transitions for a Complex World. And the subtitle of that, provisionally anyway, is Reflections of an Enraged Incrementalist. And what I'm trying to wrestle with there is rage is normally associated with the revolutionary in the room who says seizure of state power is what is required and once we have the instrument of state power, we will be able to change society. I've lived through that. I was part of the revolution in South Africa and and was very close to the decision makers who then uh, uh, made this assumption that uh, control of state power in the South African continent was, was sufficient. It was a necessary and sufficient condition to bring about transformation, which did not happen. As of today, 95% of all the wealth in South Africa is owned by 10% of the population, 80% of whom are white, and the large majority of those are men. So this is 25 years later, you know, something wasn't quite right with our theory of change. And I want to try and explore the possibility, thinking about these global challenges, my African challenges in my uh, own context, my African context, where I travel around a lot in different parts of Africa, and obviously informed by my own experience of, of transition in the South African context and in a very, very local context, like the Lion Dock uh, Eco Village. And so it's, it's really against that background uh, that I've become increasingly fascinated with the spread all around the world of what one could call urban experiments. These are vastly, vastly different in character from you know, very minor neighborhood level greening experiments to very, very significant city-wide urban infrastructure transformations around uh, mo mobility or energy. And I've become increasingly interested as I travel around in, in meeting people involved, what, what are the dynamics at play and do they matter? Do, does a multiplicity of experiments actually add up to transformation? Or when we use the word that is in the preamble of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals document, the, the preamble refers to the world's commitment to a transformed world. And from that, all over the place, every kind, whether it's the World Economic Forum or the World Social Forum, the word transformation is present in the conversation. But what is it? If we no longer believe in revolution, um, what do we go out and do? And strangely, what most of us go out and do is facilitate dialogue. And there's something incommensurate about the kind of enormity uh, of the challenges we face and what we've committed ourselves to, a process of transformation to, 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 visit, to, to, to ensure the coming about of radical change. And there's something missing in that. And I would like to explore while I'm here uh, in this book that I want to write, what does radical incrementalism mean? So I want to just lay out the argument, uh, the preliminary argument, uh, by starting with a quote from a recent book called The Experimental City by a, a, a group of Dutch, mainly Dutch uh, writers and, and editors. They define urban experimentation as an inclusive, practice-based, and challenge-led initiative designed to promote system innovation 
through social learning under conditions of uncertainty and ambiguity. And while I have been engaged in this work around experimentation, I've also been drawn into work on futuring. In particular, um, uh, the UNESCO chair uh, of, uh, of, of, of anticipatory systems at the University of uh, Trento, who's recently brought out a book uh, called Handbook of Anticipation, which really brings together a writing across many dis disciplines that is trying to deal with this question of anticipation. And a lot of what I'm drawing from here kind of comes from a chapter I wrote in that book. And I was really fascinated how engaging with the experimental um, experimentation community and the futuring community, how very little cross-pollination there is between these two. And in a, in, in a, from a, for a social scientist, this is really, really quite interesting. If I think back to Karl Polanyi's uh, double movement in his great book, uh, The Great Transformation, published in 1946, where he looked back and said that alongside the growth of harsh, laissez-faire, market-oriented capitalism, there was also a multiplicity extraordinary multiplicity of all sorts of micro-level engagements which started to add up to give rise to, an, to a more humane alternative, which he predicted would culminate in the rise of social democracy, which is exactly what happened over, after the Second World War. And I wonder to what extent we are facing a similar double movement, where on the one hand, we have the worsening of our environmental crisis, we have the worsening of inequality. We have the rise of intra-urban violence and, uh, alongside the decline of international violence. And uh, we, we, at the same time, witnessing the emergence of a large multiplicity of experimentations which are suggestive of an alternative order. And how do you bring these two together? In the futuring community, there is a distinction between three types of futurists. There are those who, talk, who, who are forecasters, essentially quantitative, and use modeling as their methodology. Then you have the foresight grouping, uh, who essentially are, uh, use qualitative information, and their methodology is narrative, or narratology, to construct a series of stories about the future and then reverse engineer back to the present. What is common about those two uh, essential ways of thinking is that they are profoundly impatient with the present. The present is seen as a kind of burning platform somewhere in between the past and the future. And they don't like the very present very much, and they don't pay much attention to it. The third group of futurists uh, emerging around uh, this uh, Pauli, um, this professor of uh, UNESCO chair of anticipatory systems in Trento, is anticipatory thinking, which is really about the evolutionary potential of the present. What glimpses of the future can we find in the way in which we see the present? It's not that it's not there, it's whether we see what's there and interpret it in, 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 in certain ways. Can we draw these together in a way that begins to allow us to understand what incrementalism might mean. Urban-centered uh, futuring and experimentation may well be the kind of emergent techniques for making sense of an opaque future from within an increasingly complex, uncertain, and ambi ambiguous, ambiguous present. So, if anticipatory thinking is about the evolutionary potential of an urban-centered experimental, di experimental dynamic where we are searching for these glimpses of the future, I thought it might be useful to review the literature on histories of the future. And one of these is an extraordinary publication commissioned by the British government and written by uh, colleagues at Lan Lancaster University uh, under the leadership of Dunn, which is called A Visual History of the Future. 
And what Dunn and his colleagues did, which was so fascinating, is that they selected 94 images of urban futures that have been influential over the last century or so and subjected them to a systematic analysis. And this was the result. They, they identified six broad categories uh, from the regulated city, uh, the layered city, um, the flexible city, the informal city, the ecological city, and the hybrid city, and positioned these images ac across these categories. I'm simplifying the argument horribly. In order to demonstrate a kind of trend uh, which I then have circled and, sh and, and argued that uh, the shift towards the top right-hand corner, towards the hybrid, which is really the, the, the kind of cyborg-type city, the co connecting of the, of the human and the, and, the, and the technological or the digital with the ecological, is a reflection of the, of the sign of the times as we, as we drift into imagining a more ecological, digitized uh, set of urban systems. And the, the predominance of the kind of layered and regulated city during the, the Fordist period of, of, of social welfareism, uh, which collapsed with the rise of neoliberalism and the breakdown of the welfare state into, into, into very different kinds of images and more, and more informalized uh, around the market. And then a shift into these, these um, more digitized ecological visions of, visions of the future. And what, I, what I, 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 I then contrast this way of thinking about the future with a body of writing that comes out of the African context. In particular, a book uh, by Malik Simone and Edgar Peterson called New Urban Worlds. And the subtitle of that is Inhabiting Dissonant Times inhabiting dissonant times. And what's interesting about this, this history is that it's com virtually none, none of the images got anything to do with the global south. In other words, none of the images have got anything to do with where the majority of urbanization is going to take place in the four decades up to 2050. And so how do we imagine the dynamics of the global south? And does this conception of experimentation in the book by these European researchers, the, uh, the experimental city, this, 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 this definition that I, that I provided, is that appropriate to what is happening where the majority of urbanization is actually taking place? And so in, what, I would, what, I, what, I, what I'm wrestling with is, the, in a sense, the two parts of me. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an intellectual trained in the Western theoretical and philo philosophical tradition. I'm rooted in uh, the African context, which in many ways defies the categories that we were inherited, uh, that we inherited throughout formal university-based uh, education. And what Simone and Peterson try and do, which is why that subtitle is so significant, Inhabiting Dissonant Times, is give a language to a set of extremely complex dynamics that are emerging within African cities about which there is very, very little understanding. In, a, in, 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 a, in, in very summary form, there is the possibility of a new kind of person emerging in African cities, the kind of person who learns, unlearns, relearns in a blink of an eye, often wearing a multiplicity of different identities depending on the context, and those get swapped and shift at will sometimes merge uh, into new kinds of identities. And what does this give rise to? So in a world where we know in the global south there is a large number of people who live in informal environments, this is particularly serious in the African context. So if you look at uh, Asia and, uh, and, 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 and the Western Hemisphere, Anything between 25 and 45% of the population are living in informal settlements in the global south. In Africa, the average is about 62 to 65%. So if you like, in many ways, African cities are slum cities, uh, except for South Africa. 
where the average is around 25 to 35%. So what does this mean? And what are the conceptions of the, of, of the future uh, in the absence of an adequate history of the future that comes out of the uh, outside, out of the, um, the southern context. I think in very, very, very crude terms, you could argue that the elites in the global south, the urban elites in the global south can identify with the, these images and say, yes, uh, we would aspire to implement within the African con context one form or another, another of this digitized ecological world. And the most articulate Express popular articulation of that is obviously the Black Panther, uh, the film. So, to take a quote from uh, Simone and Peterson as my way into this, this conversation, they argue that differentiations between local and global, public and private, exterior and interior, intensive and extensive, appear to fold into and somehow collapse upon each other within these urban dynamics. And what they argue strongly for is a granular kind of molecular feel for the dynamics of the street, for the shifts in everyday life that are shaping the future. So instead of assuming that experimentation is this kind of set piece that uh, groups of specialist facilitators facilitate in order to now get the stakeholders together to now consciously and purposively think in the context of ambiguity and uncertainty how to change things, which is really what lies at the, es in the, at the essence of that definition of experimentation by Senges et al. What you have in the many, many African contexts is experimentation is an everyday mode of living. Without experimentation, innovation, drastic failure, massive crashes of systems and recompositions, you don't survive. So what does this mean? Well, when it comes to thinking about agency, which is what I'm interested in, things like state-centric conceptions of change market-centric cent uh, conceptions of change, civil society se conceptions of, of change, simply don't work. Instead of thinking about dispositions or fixed dispositions or structures, which is really the, the, the primary inheritance of, of Western modes of social theory, we need to start thinking in the, our context, in the African context, and in be, indeed the Global South generally, in these informal environments where time and space haven't been routinized and regulated. We need to start thinking in terms of secretions, a kind of fluid, fluid congealing type dynamic that, depending on context, gives rise to very different outcomes. So what's really interesting to me, though, is that while Dunn and his colleagues and my other colleagues, uh, Simone and Peter, well, they're actually personal friends, uh, come at this, ch this challenge of thinking about the future in relation to the present in very different ways, they both end up with some sense that the future is some hybrid of the ecological, uh, the cyb cyborgic, and uh, just kind of information technology, smart technological infrastructures. Now, with that in mind, I then started to reflect on the conclusions we reached in the, in the, in the resource panel report, The Weight of Cities. And essentially what we came to at the end of that report is the idea of experimental governance. So I influenced by the... Um, Italian economist Mariana Mazzucato, who wrote a book called The Entrepreneurial State, which is really based, is, which was an attempt to explain the rise of the internet in the US context, which revealed enormous amount of state intervention contrary to the ideology of the free market. She argued that the role of the state should essentially be twofold in the 21st century. Firstly, the state should take responsibility for investment in R&D, 
in research and development. Private investments in R&D don't work because the returns on those investments accrue to society in general, so there's a disincentive for private investment. So you need public investment in R&D. And secondly, you need the state to uh, intervene to reduce risk during the early phases of the innovation cycle, when the risks are too high for private investors. So that combination uh, of ways of thinking about the future of the state, which I think uh, opens up a lot of productive uh, research fields, partly, and quite a lot of what I'm going to be writing about will be related to that, uh, we need to think about what that means at the city level, which Matsukato and her group don't do. And I think you will find many, many examples using very different kinds of language, language like triple helix partnerships between the university and private sector and public sector to uh, uh, um, partnering to all sorts of words are being used across the world in different kinds of cities. And at the essence of it is a knowledge-centered sense of innovation uh, that uh, is very increasingly, in my, in my view, very faithful to the specificities of context. And I think that idea of, of con the specificity of context is, is really extremely important when thinking about the future. And, and, and my colleagues and friends, um, Simone and Peter, say, use the word resonance. But there are many others that use very similar words to try and capture this dynamic of creativity in, 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 in cities that are starting to shift. Uh, the German uh, Advisory Council on Climate Change uses the German word, I, I don't know if I, I can never pronounce it, Eingart, uh, as a, you know, kind of action that is specific to the context. Or in academic environments, people like Fleiberg and so on use the word phrenesis, judgment that is appropriate to the context. Or, or, or maybe just in more simpler terms, resonance. When things resonate with each other, there is a connection that proceeds, not from the impositions of, of some overarching map or, or logic, but rather from a process of things extending themselves to each other, things and people. And, and dynamics extending to each other. And really, and, and, and in my sense, anticipatory thinking is about making sense of these resonances, working with them, giving meaning to what is, is, is emerging. And so it's really in, in the context of that kind of discussion, and I'm summarizing a, a lot of different layers uh, of thinking, that I started to ask myself, to what extent does this add up to a theory of change? And what do we have to let go in order for it to become an adequate theory of change? And that's when I started going back to, um, to a reading uh, or a, a oh wait, just, before I, let me, just before I get there, let me just say a, a little bit more, uh, just a little bit more about um, the dynamics of, of resonance or experimentation in, in, the Af in the African context. There's a new literature that is starting to argue that what is really interesting about what's emerging in the African context is that there might be a unique form of urbanism starting to emerge, rather than perceiving the existence of a formal enclave in a sea of informality as a kind of temporary stage towards the rolling out of the formal over the informal until we get to the normal conception of what urban really means. Instead, there's a group of writers, and I would count myself as part of that, who are starting to say, no, hybridity. Hybridity is an adequate response to the diversity of dynamics on the ground. And it's unlikely that this hybridity, this hybridization, almost cannibalization of institutionali institutionalization into a multiplicity of new forms might actually be the future. And it's here to stay. And we can't therefore compare what, what's emerging in our context to what is regarded as the norm in the Western context and then measure to what extent what we have to then do in order to get from 
the abnormal to the normal. No, redefine what normal means. The masculinist claims that only large-scale systemic interventions that shift the political economy of access and citizenship count, as that claim that only systemic change counts as the real politics amounts, uh, in, in my view, to hubris, if it is unable to recognize the power of the micro-transformations, the experimentations, if you like, in the domain of everyday living and, and psychological dispositions. So we have to reconcile, if you like, the systemic and what uh, my colleagues and I refer to as the acupunctural. How do you understand, if you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you think of the image of the acupuncture point and acupuncture needle tapping into a source of energy and twisting it and releasing energy, to what extent is that reconcilable with our understanding of systemic change? And really, that's what uh, began to uh, uh, lead me to a rereading of uh, Roberto Unger's uh, amazing book from long ago, late 90s. Uh, Roberto Unger is a professor of law at, at Harvard University. And he has spent a lot of time thinking about these issues. And I want to end off with a quote from him and a suggestion on what this means. His argument is structure fetishism is our problem. It denies our power to change the quality as well as the content of our practices and institutions, the way in which we relate to our structure-defying and structure-changing freedoms. Structure fetishism finds expression and defense in an idea, hallowed in the history of social thought, which he's written a lot about, that opposes interludes of effervescence, charisma, mobilization and energy to the ordinary reign of institutionalized routine. When, half asleep, we continue to act out the script written in the creative intervals, an extreme version of structure fetishism is the political via negative that celebrates rebellion against routinized institutional life as the indispensable opening to authentic freedom while expecting that institutions will always fall again, Midas-like, upon the insurgent spirit. Structure fetishism represents an unwarranted denial of our power to change society and therefore ourselves. So my proposition is that maybe we tend to marginalize the significance of experimentation and the, accumulated, uh, the accumulation of experimentation in an, in, into what one could call an incrementalist process because we are obsessed with structure fetishism. And when I, bring, when I return back to my original discussion of experimentation and futuring, and I find in most futurists a deep impatience with the presence and an obsession with what it takes to, re to imagine a future where structural change is assumed to be the way we get there, I am drawn towards the anticipatory way of thinking, which does value the evolutionary potential of the present and that in turn provides a meaning-making context for the experimenters who, in my view, are becoming increasingly significant around the world. What we need is a theory of change that is going to recognize the significance of what, how fast things are actually changing. And the key to that will be, and I agree with Unger, the relinquishing of what is very dear, especially those trained in Western social theory, uh, it means relinquishing this attachment to structure, the assumption that unless structure change, nothing else significant has changed. That was a fundamental error we made in the South African context. We assumed when now Nelson Mandela came out of prison, when he became president, when a, the, when a liberation movement that is nearly 100 years old uh, became the government, that that would be sufficient and we could all relax and leave it up to the state to transform society. What we have learned in the last year because of a really nasty president who seized power and started to steal the country, the mobilization of remobilization of civil society, broad-based labor movements, uh, movements of the homeless, intellectuals, academics, and the legal profession to defend our democracy was really a vindication 
of the proposition that we cannot leave everything to the state and theoretically we cannot assume that the change of structure is a is a sufficient it's a necessary but maybe said not definitely not a sufficient condition for the kinds of transformations that we have in mind when we read the preamble of the sustainable development goals that we aspire to live in a transformed world thank you very much Hi, thanks. Um, a lot to think about. I guess one question is when you talk about hybrid cities and that they're already here and they have already emerged and so on in the African context, could you be more specific about what exactly you, you mean by the different parts of this hybrid? Is it like the slums and the, I don't know, I have this image from probably Brazil or something when there's this green high rise and then the slums, right? So is that what you're referring to or something more complex? I'm, I'm talking about the emergence of a conception of the future rather than the reality. So, um, and so I'm interested in, if you like, the history and the present of ways in which we imagine the future. So your question is really about current reality. And I mean, current reality uh, is very far away from what many of the ideal images of, uh, or the idealized images of future urban living depict. So the front cover of The Weight of Cities, for example, <laughs> is just a million miles away from the, from, from the actual reality. But inside of those very complex urban forms, there are extraordinary dynamics at play. And how do we read them? So if, we, if, if our reading of them is the high-rise green building and the slums, and that's the end of the story, uh, uh, and from that we then derive a conclusion, which is, wow, you know, <laughs> uh, unless we detonate the collapse of capitalism or whatever you want to collapse uh, in order to get to some other alternative structure, you don't need to actually get any closer to that context than the green building and surrounded by a heliopolis. Uh, you don't need to get any, you're not even interested in those micro, di micro dynamics, but they are the ones that matter. And when you do get close and you start reading those dynamics, what's the language you're gonna use to give form to them? Is it just a multiplicity of projects? Is it, is it the language of social movements which, oh yes, yeah, there's a whole bunch of social movements and let's please hope that all, all kind of line up and see things together and detonate the collapse of the, of the system. Uh, or are you going to recognize that on an everyday basis, activists always connect gains to be made in the present to dreams made in the future? And how do those gains to be made in the present add up, uh, especially when uh, there isn't immediate evidence of some just around the corner sense of structural change? So I'm interested in those, this kind of very molecular, acupunctural kind of level of, of, of almost what some would regard as irrelevant minutia, uh, and I don't. I think they're having a really significant impact, but I'm not sure we have the language to really make sense of them. Hi, I, I'm interested in clarifying a bit what you mean by urban experimentation. When does kind of run-of-the-mill innovation, and or not innovation, but just trying to get through life become experimental? Do you have to be self-defined as being kind of involved in an urban experiment for it to kind of, uh, become part of your analysis? Well, I mean, the answer is yes and no. Uh, so I would say that, but I would, I would start off by saying no. It doesn't have to be self-referentially, I am part of an experiment and this is what I do and therefore this is an experiment. Uh, quite, often, quite often stuff is happening 
especially in more global south contexts, where, which are significant and might not be fully noticed by the participants themselves, but are significant. So then that raises a very difficult question. So the other part of your question is then, well, what do I mean when I talk about experiment? What qualifies and what doesn't qualify? Um, and I think, I, I don't have, a, I don't have a, a ready-made answer. I think what we have is two, two answers. The, the one answer from, this, from the book, The Experimental City, is, uh, is the sense that either you self-referential or self-referentially or others define you as an experiment, and there's some kind of conscious intent to collaborate in ways that results in some kind of local or systemic change or some kind of innovation. So that's, that is very common. And in a lot of the UN literature, et cetera, that's what's being promoted and all the international local government associations like ICLE and UCG, UGLCA, et cetera, et cetera, that's what's being promoted. Where the actors, uh, in particular local government, play a formal role in initiating a process of reimagining and system change. That's, but there is something else happening in the kind of context that I've been trying to talk about, where everyday life requires a degree of continuous inventiveness of the everyday because time and space is not fixed, routinized, regulated, and reproduced on a 24-hour uh, basis like you are used to in the, in the environments you live in. When that doesn't happen, inventiveness and, if you like, experimentation is a way of life. How do you bring these two together? Are they just on a spectrum? That would be an easy way to answer your question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or are they fundamentally different? Do, are they suggestive of something else? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I have a question. You, you talked about the granular feel of the street as perhaps a glimpse at how to understand where this is going. And I can sort of get a feel for where that might take us in the short term, but what happens in the long term? Maybe. <laughs> How long is the long term? <laughs> How long is a piece of string? Is a multiplicity of short terms adding up to the long term? Uh, and as I often ask my students who are very, very, who, who get depressed about when they say things like, things are just not changing fast enough. And I say, well, how much do you need to know about how fast things are changing in order to arrive at the conclusion about whether things are, fa are changing too slowly or fast enough? And it's based on the assumption that we know how much is changing. Uh, uh, so uh, in order to make a judgment, there actually isn't an adequate overview of the speed of change. But if you take uh, the renewable energy revolution as an example, if you um, go back to um, some of the early optimistic projections of the uptake of renewable, uh, of renewable energy, say, in the late 90s even. Let's not go too far back, you know? Late 90s, <laughs> not long ago. Uh, or, 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 or even at the turn of the millennium. <laughs> uh, and you look at the, those learning curves uh, 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 projected by... I was just looking at the guy's name at, 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 at UCL. Um, if you look at some of those learning curves, the most optimistic versions of those models were, don't capture how fast the actual learning curve has been. Any reference to renewable energy older than two years old now is completely out of date. So how do we understand that? You know? If we go back to the struggles in Freiburg against uh, renewable energy, uh, which triggered um, a shift in German policy about the feed-in tariff and the utilities who said, nah, let them do that. It's not going to make a fundamental difference. And now the utility, some of those utilities are facing serious cash flow and even bankruptcy if they don't change their business models. And you then look at German subsidization of, of renewable energy and the transfer of technology to China who then made it even cheaper. And then you look at the drop in price of renewable energy prices. How long did that take? And how, how short was long, and how, how long was short in that kind of conversation? That, I'm interested in that. 
Um, so you speak of the, um, you speak about the African context and the African situation, and I I was wondering what does that mean? Is that um, um, I, I mean obviously even as a non-African, I know that Africa is an entire continent full of diversity. Yeah. So is this um, a simplification that you use for this audience, or is it? in contrast to everything that is not Africa? Or is, is it some kind of overarching um, similarities and common things that, um, that go beyond the um, uh, unique characteristics of different people, different locations? Yeah. What does it mean? So obviously giving a talk, you have very little time, and it's a simplification. So that's the short answer to your question. Um, at the same time, Africa is not a place. Uh, contrary to the statements of some policymakers here, um, it's nor is it a shithole, um, and it's it's a very 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 diverse multiplicity of contexts thrown together, um, culturally, structurally, hist history of colonialism, etc., etc., etc. All of that, all of that, I fully fully accept. However, however. There are, at the level of the urban in particular, uh, an extraordinary range of commonalities, structured really by one particular dynamic, which is the uh, number of people living in informal environments. So yes, that how that it gets handled and managed uh, by the people themselves and by the city managers or government will shift in emphasis here and there. But the dynamic is fundamentally the same. And it's what, I, what, what, uh, what a, a North African writer uh, called Bayer refers to as quiet encroachment. This is not the outcome of, on the whole, on the whole, because there are exceptions. This is not the outcome of kind of revolutionary movements to seize, seize land. It's the outcome of literally hundreds of thousands, millions of incremental encroachments at the household or groups of household kind of levels in order to gain footholds in the urban system, initially from the peripheries and then moving inwards, depending on family networks. And I think that is fairly common. How it feels, how people respond in those is obviously context specific. Uh, and so I think, uh, Excluding South Africa in particular, and parts of North Africa, although not all parts, you can generalize using a word like African dynamics uh, to refer to what's happening in these, in these urban systems. But it is dangerous to do, and I would never, ever do that in my own context. Thanks, Mark. I, I thought your talk was extremely thought-provoking, and I'm thrilled that you're here. You know, I think that your talk in many ways touched on, I mean, you obviously spoke of the urban, but I think the issues that you raise in many ways touch at the heart of the challenges and the tension that the environmental movement and the environmental scholarship faces on, in many ways. So we could take the urban out and we can say whether it's climate change or biodiversity or whatever may, that may be, but that there are dominant discourses that are developed, let's say, by the global north and that many place-based work that's, let's say, from the global south or maybe case studies often don't make it to these national or international dialogues. And I'm thinking very specifically about, for example, the IPCC, because I'm very familiar with that. And when you look at the, um, you know, the future that many of us have, let's say, forecasted, they're based on data that are either nationally or you know, at some level available at the national or let's say even state level or local level, but that then at presupposes that there's the institutions and governance and legitimacy to collect those data, right? That often doesn't make it to the discussion about whether the data and these forecasts are themselves even legitimate. 
anyway, so I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, and I think that w one of the things that I took from your talk is not only the need to provide much more bottom-up and place-based approaches, but the importance of a uh, diverse set of experiences and how important that is. You know, I'm just thinking again about the IPCC and having your countrywoman, Deborah Roberts, as a, a co-chair has already changed the conversation at IPCC. Uh, so, you know, she's a South Africanist. She's a, for those of you who don't know, she, she's a scientist, but she's also worked in, at the local urban level for a long time. And now at the IPCC, she's saying, well, we actually need to inject this very level, very different level of dialogue, which is both bottom up and also top down and challenging the legitimacy of only providing these information or forecasts at a grand scale or you know, at, a, at a larger scale. Mm -hmm. um, because I think a big question is, you know, we have a lot of these forecasts about, let's say, climate or urbanization or emissions, but it's, there's a complete disconnect with how do we actually get there? Mm -hmm. And I, that's one of the things I found very thought provoking about your talk. I do have a question though. And my question is, um, you said, does, because much of your talk was about a theory of change, and you said, do local experimentations add up to a theory of change? And my question is, based on your work, do you see that local experimentation is actually adding up to the change that we need? Not the theory, but the change that we need. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so I was lost inside your first part, so I'm, I'm just going to bring myself back to your question. Um, the, uh, I mean, lost in a good way. I was like, <laughs> I was thinking about what you were saying uh, rather than. Um, I, I would, I, my, um, the, the way I formulated to myself, does, does the spreading multiplicity of what one could call experiments with the proviso of, of the question that was asked about that. Uh, but s settling on seeing it as more a spectrum of, exper of experiments, does all of that add up to what I would call radical incrementalist change? Uh, so the normal question in social science is, does it add up to a revolutionary rupture? Uh, so there's and, and there's a there's a piece missing in the question uh, uh, about what kind of quantum or qualitative shift is the outcome of a multiplicity of experiments which add up to what Unger refers to as as a kind of a radical incrementalism uh, uh, and and do, to what extent is that capable of bringing about a real change? So. My answer would be that there is so much happening at such an accelerated speed, the renewable energy revolution just being one, uh, many, many other things, um, that I do think, especially as social scientists, and I think also within the environmental science environment, we don't have an adequate theory to make sense of what's already, I think, significant. So my answer to your question would be, Yes, I think it's significant, undoubtedly, and there's more and more and more evidence building up to kind of, that is suggestive of that, and one needs to think about that uh, in a more deeper way. But we have to go one step further and actually see, ask the question, is there a theory of change that is commensurate with the polycrisis that we face? And most people who accept the sustainable urban goals, need for a transformed world, the results of the IPCC, the results of the IRP, if you ask them and say, well, now what are you going to do about this? They say, we're going to facilitate dialogues. And there's something anemic and inadequate about that response. There's, it's, it's, you know, it's so different from what you would say in the late 1800s or early 1900s. I'm going to lead a revolution and I'm going to seize power. You know, there's something, <laughs> there's something not right in our, in our, in our theory of change. 
uh, which guides what we actually do. Once we have accepted, we need to live in a transformed world. Uh, there's not the same requisite degree of passion, uh, nor a real understanding of power and how power shifts. Uh, and that's really what I'm interested in. Mark is an inhabitant of the uh, stodgy and structured global north. I'm trying to get my head around um, the intuitive sense of things you're making reference to. And I was really struck by your description of uh, people changing ident identities and um, I think there was another component uh, quickly and repeatedly. Can you give an example? Uh, <laughs> um, okay, well, I can't give an, obviously an example from your, from your context. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, so, um, oh, there's just so many. I mean, that's just how things are. So, uh, let me give an example of the mayor of Blantyre, a woman who, uh, by day, is formerly the mayor, who basically earns almost nothing and has virtually no power over the, the future of the town. But she's also many other things. So she will have a market store. Uh, she will have a network with a group of women who have a, have, have a group of savings clubs. She will, on the weekends, be part of meetings with uh, Shack Dwellers International, whatever their local affiliate is called. Um, and all of these roles don't necessarily get separated in time. So, okay, this is what I do over the weekend. This is what I do while I'm in my office. They'll get merged. And a multiple set of transactions will be taking place at any one time that, from an outsider's perspective, might even be construed as corrupt, uh, but is very faithful to a set of laws, or, or norms, not laws, but a set of norms of the way things to get done in dysfunctional institutional environments that require you to be a number of different things at the same time. I'm just giving you one uh, practical, practical example. Um, and there, there would be many others. So if you, if you go down a street, if you go down a back, uh, like, a, like a certain back street off the main road in Lagos at two o'clock in the morning, it's packed. The next street down, there's nobody. What the hell are these shops? What's really going on there? That's an international financial exchange, moving money through the Hawala system around the world at remarkable speeds without a single dollar crossing a border. It's coordinated from the street. What? what? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Next week will be much more uh, yeah, yeah, calmer yeah. and uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> quantitative. <laughs> <laughs>